Welcome back, everybody, to Uncensored CMO. Now, if you're in the UK, you might know that next week is MadFest, one of the coolest, most vibrant and useful marketing conferences in the UK. Gets a packed audience, some wonderful speakers, and it's really high energy and a great opportunity to meet other marketers. If you're going, look out for me. I will be there. It'd be lovely to meet you. I thought it would be great to catch up with one of the speakers from this year, who's Tom Rainsford. He is the marketing director at Beavertown Brewery. I love Tom. He's got so much passion and energy, and he's worked on challenger brands his career. He was a co-founder at GifGaf, and more recently, he's become marketing director at Beavertown. So I wanted to chat to Tom about what makes a great challenger brand, and particularly the role of people and culture, which he is really passionate about. Um, I also get him to talk a little bit about the preview of his talk at Madfest. So no big secrets revealed but he talks us through what he's planning for this year so if you're going there do listen to this episode it's a great conversation with one of the coolest guys in marketing tom so welcome to Uncensored cmo hello thanks for having me let's start here with a question maybe um you've got a rather unusual route into marketing haven't you what's that all about yeah so i did um i did a degree in contemporary dance which I loved and, and continue to love. Pina Bausch is a hero of mine. And then I did some stuff after university, did some, you know, different performances at theatres in London and all that kind of thing. And then I didn't have any money and needed to do something which I thought would be creative, but might be able to pay the rent. And an opportunity came up working in marketing, which was working on kind of like healthcare and a bit of health and beauty and stuff. Got that job and then that was me in the world of marketing, really. And it's just been a kind of continuation from there of finding different interesting particularly disruptive or challenger brands to work on what i love about this is i don't think i've ever met anyone a senior marketer who's actually done marketing as a degree i mean i think this is why mark ritson is cleaning up right now with his mba because everyone's like yeah i feel a bit of a fraud here i'm not actually studying marketing i better go and get catch up with it a bit sort of thing i mean i did finance as well which is a bit different but it's incredibly useful actually not coming from marketing i think because it gives you a kind of perspective on the world doesn't it yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think I was quite lucky in the, in the first role that I had was very traditional. You know, you had your product that you looked after specifically, you had your budget, it sat on your desk, the product, you talked a lot about packaging and on shelf and, you know, point of sale. So it was very, not that I knew it at the time, but it's very sort of traditional schooling in marketing. So I think that kind of helped. But I think it's a bit like anything, which is like, I think particularly from a CMO from a marketing director's perspective, I think it's good to take different viewpoints from different perspectives, really, because ultimately, otherwise, it's all a bit of an echo chamber. And I don't think that helps you make good decisions. Yeah. Now, we're going to come and talk about Beavertown, of course. But actually, your career has been sort of known for uh, being a challenger, really, to the establishment. And actually, the the, the part of your career you spent most of the time on is GIFCAF, actually, which is, a, if you think about the tech in, you know, well, mo- well telco industry and how dominated it is by a few players... Explain what you were doing at GiftGaff, because you were like employee number four, were you? got very, very early on and, and co-founded the business as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this guy called Gav Thompson, who had this idea about basically David versus Goliath and wanted a fair, mutual and simple mobile network. I was at T-Mobile at the time, which obviously then became EE further down the line. And someone rang me up and said, there's this challenger brand, we can't tell you anything about it. Do you want to come and talk to them? And I thought, well, why not? I've got I've got nothing to lose. Um, so I met a couple of people. I spent my first interview pretty much talking about Gossip Girl, which at the time was, you know, the number one TV show. I'm not sure why, but that is what we talked about. And then me and 13 other people, so 14 of us, launched it in 2009. And then I spent 10 years there very much sort of taking that idea of David versus Goliath and being disruptive in the mobile market, which, you know, has lots of big players in it. Um, so there's, you know, space for challenger brands and, and that was a position and we made it into what it is today. I like the David and Goliath analogy. It kind of resonates easily, doesn't it, with the challenge. But what is it that GifGaf did that made it the David to the Goliath? I mean, can you share some of the what made that successful? Yeah, I think there's a few things. I think, first of all, it had a very strong point of view, right? Which sounds strange, but often those points of view are retrofitted into a business or a brand rather than being on a, I mean, there was literally a piece of paper when I joined with some bullet points on it. It was like eight bullet points, right? And it was about mutuality, gift gaffes, as an old Gaelic word for mutual giving. So it was, you know, in, in traditional senses, the equity of the brand was baked in from day one. So that that's a key part. We delivered that through having a different business model. So it didn't have retail stores, which in 2009, people were like, you know, this is mad. Like, And, and a lot of people genuinely thought it was going to fail. 
We involved our what we call members, customers in how the business worked, you know, way before, you know, Kickstarter existed or, or whatever else. And therefore that delivered against that concept of mutuality. And we, you know, paid them lots of money, you know, and they donated to charity and all kinds of things like that. So the brand really was built out of the concept of people and people power and the mobile network run by you, and this idea around David versus Goliath and mutuality. And it worked because we stayed true to what we were trying to do. And I think, you know, through my tenure there, really the core job that I was there to do was to protect the equity that we were building. So we did that, of course, in ways like above the line and below the line and blah, 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 blah. But ultimately, it was about the protection of what is the magic that's within that brand. And I think that's why it then work. So, so you got, I mean, you've got two big disadvantages there. So you've got the, the big telco companies have got high street presence, haven't they? They've literally got retail outlets that every one of us walking down the high street will see, Vodafone, et cetera, et cetera. And they've got enormous advertising budgets to make sure that when you're online or you're watching your TV, you've got advertising pretty much 24-7. So how do you fight against those two very, very big disadvantages that you had? So I think, you know, it goes back to that classic, you can't outspend so outsmart, Right. So we knew that we wanted to make this brand really relevant for people. And we knew that there were people that had high levels of dissatisfaction. Some brands have minus NPS scores, right? Which is quite, you know, quite an achievement. So we knew there were huge amounts of dissatisfaction, but rather than focusing on the dissatisfaction, we actually told them what we did instead, and they could connect those two dots. So I think making really savvy decisions about how you wanted to talk to people, when you wanted to talk to them, gave you the opportunity to build a brand supported by great products at price points that people wanted and those hygiene factors work. And I guess my whole point of view is great brands are both emotional and rational. You want your phone to work when you want to make a call or, you know, do people make calls? When you wanted to make a call or, you know, go on Instagram or whatever. But equally, you want to have some emotional connection. And I think particularly in that market, somewhere that emotional connection had got lost in forgetting about people for 23 months until their contract came up and it felt very commoditized and very big brands and just being a different player in that different attitude different body language made us very relevant for people and that relevancy is you know absolutely key and of course in mobile it's like people sleep with their phone right do you know what i mean you can't really get much closer so therefore there is a connection and there is a relationship so purely by opening a door to a different world people were happy to walk through i think this often happens in tech doesn't it people forget that people often market the tech and not what the tech does or can do for you isn't it because you think about your phone is your connection to the world connection to the loved ones it allows you to ask a question of the world and get an answer to it doesn't it it's an amazing kind of portal into other things but most of the marketing we see is it's got 16 megabits or whatever or it's like got this much battery life you know it's right. the emotion gets forgotten doesn't it i mean it it, it it massively does it took a global pandemic for qr codes to become relevant and useful right so my point of view on technology is there has to be a human need and desire or question or problem that needs to be answered and technology can become the answer to that often when it's technology dictating what should happen that's where that dichotomy comes in now was anyone wandering around saying oh i'd love an online encyclopedia of things that i can go to that you know no probably not but that desire for information was there that desire to learn that desire to search for things was there right so I think, you, I think you have to have that. I also think that, that tech businesses, not just tech businesses, lots of businesses, but, but particularly in tech, their internal language and internal way of looking at things pours outwards, right? There is no reason, really, why people are wandering around talking about 5G or 4G or 3G. You know, 5G was called LTE. It was called... This is internal language that is then forced on people externally. So, you know, hyper fibre, you know, like broadband that's at this mega... You know, no one knows. No one understands it. Normal consumers don't, right? I think, the, you know, it's, it's a bit like, you know, within the world of beer, right? Which is, I don't expect or want people to necessarily know all the hops and what the individual hops smell like before they go and make the beer. If you do, that's wicked and that's great and, you know, 
fantastic you're you're that passionate right and of course the people that make the beer need to feel that way but a consumer just buying it in waitrose or going into young's pubs they don't need to know that they just want a cracking drink and that's absolutely fine and i think sometimes it gets a bit muddy and you as a marketeer becomes used to the language and suddenly it's on a bus and then it's in the real world, right? It's a classic one, isn't it? As marketers, we assume the consumer is a lot more interested in our product than it, than they actually are. Maybe, like you say, maybe 5% are actually looking the hops up and, you know, really into the process or whatever. But most people just want a great drink, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I think that's what ultimately brands are there to service the needs or answer the question or do whatever that insight is and deliver against it, right? How you do that, how you can uh, construct the you know, SIM that goes in the phone. It, it doesn't matter. If people do care, wicked, that's great, right? But not everyone needs to know that. And I think that's quite important. And sometimes I think, particularly in technology, that, that does get lost. Yeah. Now, before we get into beer, because obviously we're uh, dying to do that, in terms of how you made the work as well at GiveCo, you did a lot in-house, didn't you? And it, I notice a lot of challengers do do that. You know, they, they, they produce themselves. Why would you in-house rather than do what most you know most businesses do and bring agencies in to do that for you you know we tried a few different things at, at give Gaff. we had agencies for a period of time and then basically we, I, I brought it in house the reason i brought it in house is twofold one is a cost element which is like instead of paying retainer or whatever it might be i can take that money we can put it into media or we can increase production or get that balance right so there's like a sort of economic aspect to it but ultimately it's down to the principle that I believe that the people that are responsible for the brand, which is marketing and the the wider people that work for that business, should be creatively involved, right? So they shouldn't outsource the responsibility for the creative of that brand. Now, I understand that some brands need to do that because of size, because that's what they've done, because they don't want to build, you know, and I'm not questioning that at all. I'm not questioning how other people do it. But for us... At GIFGAF, we felt that the right thing to do was to be able to to bring it in house. That didn't mean that we entirely stopped working with you know agencies. It just meant we had more options. So therefore, I might write something or direct it, or some of the team might do that, or we might go straight to production houses and work directly with directors or producers or whatever. It just opened up more options to us, and we felt that that was the right decision. And 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 I'd argue the creative output that, that we had. Obviously, sometimes you look back at campaigns and go, oh, God, why did we do that? But I'd say in the main, you know, I'm pretty proud of what we did. And I think that it was very different and it and it built the brand in, in the right way for the success it's gone on to have. Well, I noticed actually in that time you got uh, Creative Reviews, one of the top 50 creative minds in the country, didn't you, as well, was during that time? Yes, that was very nice of them. Yes, um, thank you, Creative yeah, Review. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, all things are a team a team sport, aren't they? But, but I think that's probably the re- reason a lot of businesses probably don't in-house as much as they could do. It's probably for that reason, isn't it? Is your what you're hiring is that creative talent. So how do you nurture creativity within a company to, to achieve the kind of outcome you, you did? I think it's a combination of things. I think you have to value creativity, right? And I'd question whether or not creativity is valued in the same way as the numbers, right? Or whatever might be important to that team. So I think you have to start there. So I think you have to value creative as as a process. I think you have to value it and see it not added on at the end or something that people over there do or something you can outsource. It needs to be baked in. To value it, you need to have it within your value set as a business, right? And whatever your culture is, whatever you think is important and all the rest of it, it has to be weaved through that. And then on a practical basis, you have to have a different approach to working with people than traditionally you would, right? Which is creative people, and, you know, arguably we're all creative, but creative people might have a different way of working than the finance department. And you have to be okay with that. And I'm not always sure that people really recognise that or understand it or want to do it. So I think it has to be baked into your values and you have to have a practical uh, approach as a business that allows that to happen, which may be different than the traditional processes and approaches that business. That's a really interesting, really interesting idea. That because there's so much evidence that suggests that creativity is pretty much the number one thing with it at your disposal to drive business results. But I don't think I've ever heard of a company that has we value creativity as part of its values, or that has processes that designed to 
not be structured to allow creativity to happen rather than, you know, try and deliver operations, let's say. Because there's that tension in business between the efficiency of getting the job done and creativity doesn't work that way. Creativity is not something that you can kind of plan for in, in the same sense. You need to create the environment for it, don't you? But it's an interesting idea because creativity is so valuable and yet it's so not often embraced by a company. I think it's a broader problem. I think we don't value creativity in the school system. I think art is seen as like a cop out. And what you do instead of doing something more important, you know, we've got a prime minister at the moment that seems to want everyone to do maths for eternity. Of course, an understanding of maths is And AI, of course. Right? (laughs) Maths and AI. But they're not not mutually exclusive, right? So I think there's a huge problem with how we... um, how we how we look upon creativity as a whole from very very early on i think from a business perspective i think it's i think we're caught between two stools at the moment right and i think that situation has been heightened by and let's use the word covid right because it started to question the approaches that businesses had and it had been sort of chipping away and the sort of notion that people might work from home one day a week and all the rest of it and covid just blew the doors off traditionally businesses may not have needed to allow creativity in because that was something you outsourced to advertising agencies or or creative agencies or whatever now it's slightly different i think and i think that there's bigger questions that businesses need to ask themselves in regards to what is it they want to do not from a creative perspective or not only from a creative perspective but but entirely the proposition that businesses have is very different because the needs, particularly you see that in, you know, people that are starting out their careers are very different. And actually what the market and consumers want is very different. So therefore you have to fundamentally question your approach. That's quite hard to do if you've got a massive juggernaut to turn around, right? So therefore, is it easier to just sort of do what we've always done and sort of just give people pizza on Wednesdays them fundamentally ask the question and of course you know particularly you know i don't know i've I've never worked for you know massive businesses directly but like safety stability is probably important right so actually some of those big changes you know do you do you want to make them do you need to make them so i think it's a massive fundamental question basically (laughs) I think I've covered the school system all the way up to like, you know, mass, mass capitalism That's in, pretty, one, yeah, pretty in one answer. <laughs> the interesting thing, I thought COVID was a, both a constraint to creativity and a liberator as well, because what it did do is suddenly you realise, oh, we can make something really quickly. We can outsource it to the world. We can sign stuff off over a Zoom call rather than have to be in the room and travel South Africa to, you know, oversee the production of it. Um, it did also show we could do some amazing things. Now, I, I, you know, equally we had sort of very, you know, everyone started doing the same kind of creative. Yeah, I know yeah. There was that too, wasn't the piano, there? Yeah, the piano. Yeah, melancholy piano. You know, in these unprecedented yeah, times yeah. and, you know, yeah. piano music goes. There was that, of course. But it did show that actually there were so many more creators around the world than we realised existed that actually some stories told very simply by, you know, people, you know, telling stories between themselves could be very, very powerful. You know, we could access talent wherever it was in the world. No longer didn't have to be in central London yeah. anymore it could be done on a shoestring I mean there were a lot of positives that happened but the Covid was both a blessing and a curse wasn't it in some ways I think it just asked questions that needed to be asked that that you couldn't do at such a mass level without you know a situation like that happening where suddenly everyone's told to work from home and you've got to kind of you know muddle your way through it I remember saying to the team I was like look you know I think it was the first day or something I was like look I've never managed a team for a pandemic before right so we're gonna just have to figure this out together I do think that that it did give different approaches and opportunities that probably needed to be modernized that hadn't been for for lots of reasons I think the creativity thing i think is interesting because i think again it was kind of more just covid put it under the microscope right which is the media mix is more complicated than ever there's more channels people want you to spend on all of them right you know huge growth in influencer and therefore influencer agencies and there is creativity happening right to your point you know there's amazing people making amazing things all around the world and they're bedrooms or living rooms or whatever right so it's difficult to 
work out how that applies to your marketing mix and where to go. But I think the important thing is, is that you have to embrace it and set up approaches that will allow that creativity and those ways of working to to happen yeah yeah i mean one of the other my colleague orlando actually wrote a book called look out which is really fascinating he took many many years of kind of art history and what he did is he traced how art changed in response to society art's almost like a mirror up to society really and actually as you look through art you see it reflecting society as it changed and he drew this really interesting comparison between stages of industrial revolution led to what he calls society looking inwards uh, hence why it's called the book look out really but what happens is when when societies are going through industrial revolutions it becomes very mechanistic it becomes very individual um there's there, there's a lot of power and control going on whereas in as he would call it more right brain societies you know renaissance or romantic periods and so on it's more about the collective it's more about people connecting it's more about community enjoying things together sort of thing but what happens in the left brain phases, like the industrial revolutions, is that's when you see anxiety, you see stress, you see people warring and go, you know, you know, people divided into different kind of tribes, that kind of thing. And that's, you know, the, what goes often before conflict. And you look at that and you think that's sort of what we're experiencing today, isn't it? That, the you know, COVID accelerated the industrial revolution to some extent. And we're seeing the kind of result of that negatively in society as well as the positive what it able, enables us to do but it's quite profound in terms of the impact i think on people and culture it also and i'd love to know your point of view on this as well it makes managing teams harder because whereas before we were together and we understood this is a classic kind of right brain thing we'd understand nuance we'd understand relationship we'd we'd kind of get the joke together we you know if, if you said something i that upset me i could talk to you about it on the spot right on Zoom, that doesn't happen, right? You don't get all that stuff. And it, it makes managing teams and creating culture hard, hard, harder, I think. I said that um, I said at MabFest last year when I was presenting that I think that this is the first time since the Industrial Revolution that we need to really question our approaches to working. You know, from a Beaver Town perspective, we make product, right? Physical product, people have to go there and do their amazing stuff. But there's an awful lot of businesses that don't have to go to one site, a factory site, right, to make stuff. So therefore, why is everyone going to the same place at the same time, which creates loads of travel issues, which creates loads of environmental issues. It creates loads of stress because you've got to rush here or rush there or drop the kids off or do this, do that. And it, 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 it just doesn't work, right? Like, you know, I remember when I started my career, it would take me hours to get to work because everything was so, you know, I used to drive and the roads were awful. Like, how stupid is that, right? Those moments, you're killing productivity. I would rather get up at six. I'm woken up by a three-year-old and a six-month-year-old. But I would, I would rather personally like just wake up naturally, but, you know, at six and start working at seven, right? Because I'm already thinking about it. But if I have to get on a tube for an hour, right, or an hour and a half or whatever, so, so the system just doesn't really yeah. work. So we have to question it. Now, to your point around managing, you're absolutely right. You know, you look at the stuff from Gallup, it's like over 70% of your engagement and viewpoint on your work is dependent on your manager so therefore we as leaders we as managers have a huge impact on the people that therefore work for us but i think it's about understanding individuals and what works for that business which means that a cookie cutter approach is irrelevant right because you've got to understand people on a people level which takes time right and and relationship building and you've got to understand what works for your business and then set up the you know processes approaches whatever you want to call them to manage grow develop that team appropriately you know the thing that keeps me up more than anything else at night right yes of course you worry about above the line campaigns and results and whether or not you've you know some big decision whether or not you've made the right decision of course we're all human but what really worries me is Am I developing my team? Are they getting what they want out of it? Uh, do I need to be more ruthless with direction in a good way? You know, it's it's those things. Because ultimately, a business is just the people that work for it. And I think that that's some of the problem, which is when you go into, you know, senior meetings or whatever, you know, it's like sales figures first, right? And I think certainly at Beavertown and certainly at Gifgal, it was like, right, let's talk about people. 
right? And then go from there. Because without the people, you won't actually do anything. That's, <laughs> right? so, that's so interesting. I, 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 uh, I was chatting to Dom at uh, Yorkshire Tea, mm. and they oh. consciously, you know, they consciously dedicate 20% of all meetings to how are you? Right. And, and basically, they know what you do the weekends, they know the kids' names, they know what, you know, what sport they're into, which team they support. And they actually said the value of that connection and that understanding and that empathy is well worth the 20 percent of every meeting is dedicated actually planned for that yeah. which i just think is, is just so well it's, well done yeah, yeah i mean i agree uh, you know 20 percent of all meetings are dedicated to how was your weekend and talking about football right yeah. so that's the that's easily 20 percent at the beginning of, of a meeting so you could just kind of reduce some of that to fit in to fit in people i think there's a really interesting thing which is like how are you versus how do you feel and I think if you ask people, how do you feel and how do you feel about this and how do you feel at the moment, you'll possibly get a more honest answer than the classic, you know, traditionally British, right? Which is like, how are you? Yeah, great. And it's like... No, you're not. No, you're not. Because <laughs> I know how... I know, I know you worked late last night. I know how much you've got on or, you, you, you know, you've got an issue with your house or whatever it might be, right? So I think that actually changing the way of looking at people as commodities to look at people as people which i think is happening but i still think we could probably go a little bit further with that right and actually understanding that feeling aspect i think is 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 really important right well obviously at system one that's that's what we set our business up to do in fact i mean but i think the thing with if you're in in the left brain kind of industrial revolution complex way if all you do is focus on task you'll never get to the people and, and that, 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 I think, is when the, the tensions between people happen, where someone lets someone else down, it doesn't get resolved, there's no trust, that leads to suspicion, and, and, and then you get breakdown in communication. And I see that such, you know, happen to such a lot, is you've got to invest in the people and the, and the trust building as well. I think, I mean, you literally just brought in the word that I was going to use, which is trust, right? I think if I, you know, went deliberately extreme on it, I'd say that a lot of, I don't know, luckily not the businesses I work for, but I imagine, well, I'll tell you, I, okay, I'll spin it another way, which is I was, in a, um, I was in a cab the other day and the cabbie was saying to me, he was talking about his brother that works in tech, right? And he said, um, yeah, yeah, like he works from home two days a week, but he's got to be in the office three to four days a week so they can keep an eye on him. Right. <laughs> and I just thought whether or not it was just turn a phrase or whatever, but I just thought, that concept of if I can't see them working, they're not working, right? And that goes back to your industrial revolution. That goes back to your workhouses. It goes back to that commodity approach. And how stupid is that? Like, where's the trust in that? And if you don't trust people, why are they working for you, right? If you think people are going to just sit at home and do nothing, they're probably just going to come to the office and do the same, right? But they're just going to sit at a desk that you paid for, right? Yeah. Well, let me put my dilemma to you, right? Because 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 I totally agree. I think there are two things that that kind of battle with each other. So I totally agree that we should be able to trust people as to do the job how they want to do it and to get it done and not have to check up on them, right? Totally agree. Working from home and technology enables that, so I can I can drop the kids off, I can get my dentist appointment done, I can do all that kind of thing. That is such a, an advantage. The downside is trust is built through people working together getting to know each other personally and overcoming some of those obstacles quickly, right? So you go, oh, you didn't mean to piss me off like that the other day. And, oh, I understand the pressure you're under. How do you foster that if you're not together? So that, that's, that I think, is where the, the tension comes in. Because I've seen teams that have kind of gone into battle with each other that had they been in the same room, that would not have happened. You know, had they been down the pub together on a Thursday evening, you know, that would not have happened. So how do you get the balance between creating that trust, which requires presence, and then enabling the trust, which means that you can do what you want at home yeah. as long as you get a job done. I think my, my argument and point of view on it is it's not about not bringing people together. It's about not putting them back in, a, in an approach which didn't work, right? So if you think about creativity, you know, you take the, the, the classic story about Guinness and worth the weight, right? Where did they come up with the idea? They went to the pub, right? Because that's where the product is consumed and watched what was happening and then, you know, went from there. So I don't think it's a case of, of, of people sitting at home isolated from each other. I think it's about understanding the best way to put your team together to achieve 
um, what it is you ultimately want to achieve, right? And I think that's the thing. I think it's like, you know, no great idea has ever been come up with sitting in a room on a silly desk, you know, like, uh, you know, five minutes past nine on a Monday. Same. Like, so, so, yes, of course, we need to bring people together. We're, we're human beings. We want to socialise and be together. And, you know, ultimately, that's what Beaver Town's about, right? We yeah. give people beer to accompany their good times, you know, in a pub, you know, watching bands, whatever it might be. So you still need to do those things. I think that the answer isn't just doing what you used to do, right? Because that's not evolving. Yeah. And I think there has to be a point, which there is clearly, where people are asking the question and we're looking for the answers. Yeah. And you can figure out the answers together, right? As leaders, we should listen to people that have different points of view to us. We should try and understand them as much as we can. And we shouldn't always believe we know the answer, right? And if you can do those three things, then you can construct a better day tomorrow than you can today. Now, you mentioned Beaver Town. I'm glad you did because we've been sat here looking at two cans of neck oil in front of us. Or, <laughs> and I've got rather thirsty. Um, why, don't we, why don't we grab a beer? This would be a good time to grab a beer. And uh, tell me about what I'm drinking. I'd love to know a bit more. For, 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 for those listening, uh, Tom is holding up Beaver Town neck oil. This is neck oil. This is our number one beer. Give this a little try here as well. It's a session IPA. It's 4.3. Mm. Super drinkable, super sessionable. It's really great. It's our number one seller. And I guess the thing about neck oil is it's completely accessible. So it doesn't really matter whether or not you're into craft. And I'd question the whole sort of concept yeah. of, of, of craft because it's just gone mainstream, right? You can buy it in the same places you can buy, you know, mainstream or traditional beers. So therefore, it's accessible. It's on the it's on the bar where you want it. We've seen huge growth. It's amazing. You know, we've got a really um, big above the line campaign out at the moment during the summer, which is based in the in the neck oil world. And what's really important to the brand, as you see on the can, is the kind of visual identity in the worlds that we do. So whether or not it's neck oil or it's gamma ray or it's you know. Um, We've got a new beer out called Satellite this week. Um, whichever one it is, they all tell a different narrative. Now, if you look upon it from a marketing perspective, you could say, well, hang on a minute. Like, I want, uh, where's the kind of consistency from it, right? Because all of them look slightly different, right? And Nick, who are, who's our creative director that's, you know, um, drawn everything, essentially, draws it all by hand. So every time he draws it, it changes slightly, right? So there, there, there isn't that coherent, um, that But isn't the consistency thing. and the inconsistency, if that's not a, well, it is. a slight it's, irony? Well, it's, it's, co yeah. it's coherent, right? It's, yeah, it's coherent, yeah. Because for me, you can go into, you know, a pub and Young's or you can go into Waitrose or Sainsbury's or whatever. You can look at the range of beers and you can understand that our beers are different, you know, flavours, ABVs, names, etc. But you understand they're a part of a portfolio, they're, they're a part of a family, right? And that's really important because I think it makes it interesting, yeah, right? It and it makes it disruptive and it's different to, you know, often, you know, beer brands with like one key beer and more recently they've gone into zeros and various things like that, right? But it's kind of all taken from that umbrella hero brand. We have different brands, you know, and, and if you want to go deeper, you can go to our website and get into specials and advent calendars and all the, all kind of wild and wonderful things. But if you don't, you can still just go in the pub and enjoy an echo. I, I mean, as again, we were talking earlier about my very short-lived career at BrewDog. I was um, surprised at actually how accessible a lot of craft beer is. Because I guess, I guess when, when, when you're not into craft beer, you look at the catering and you think, this must be super strong. It must be very esoteric. It must be really, you know, um, hard to drink. But actually, there are some beautifully accessible beers that are refreshing, fruity, you know, uh, very sessionable. So it's, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? Category perception is it's going to be quite a challenge, but actually there's some amazingly drinkable beers and so much choice. I mean, like you can get anything from like a really stout, heavy, chocolatey, high alcohol kind of stout on one end to a, something that's almost lager-like you know, on the other end. And, and, and that was the whole idea. So Logan that founded Beaver Town was in the States and saw what craft beer was doing over there, brought it back to the UK well, one of his big things was he just wanted a beer that anyone could drink, right? Yeah. And that's exactly what neck oil is. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit of 
kind of citrus in there there's a little bit of fruitiness it's kind of you know you can it's got a flavor to it but it's not overpowering it's not too hoppy so it just feels like it kind of ticks those boxes that people want from a kind of lager point of view but just gives a little bit more flavor and a little bit of a zing to it all and that and that's really where where kind of neckle comes in and it's funny actually because system one we do a lot of innovation testing actually and we have this principle that successful innovation is often 80% familiar, 20% new. And it, 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 it got that right, didn't it? It was like, you know, if you're used to, if you're used to lagers, you're probably going to like this. You know, it's like a lager with a bit of fruitiness, a bit, a bit of depth to it, but it's not jumping you to something that's so difficult. And then, but of course, once you try this, you go, well, okay, well, I'm, I'm ready for a bit more flavour now, or you can try the next one then, can't you? Yeah, ex- exactly. And I, th- I think the thing is, is for us, we just, you know, we, we, want to be inclusive in the product ranges and, and approaches we have you know i heard someone once say what i really like about beaver town is when i go to a party and i hold a can it always starts a conversation and i thought how amazing is that right like it, it, you know yes of course we you know brands often want to be the hero thing that you know is up there and everyone's like, oh my god that brand's amazing right but actually just to be additive to a social situation where people are coming together to have a good time and you start a conversation between two people it's pretty beautiful like that's a really nice it, place for us it to is do. well alcohol is quite you know inner directed isn't it it says something about you what you drink doesn't it is almost like a you know extension of your personality in some ways but industrial beers are so similar it's like provenance but basically it's where you know where the beer's from is the main thing isn't it are you from spain or italy or france or whatever whereas actually so much more personality in, in craft beer isn't there i mean we 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 want to create stories right and i know lots of brands say that but quite literally the cans are a story mm-hmm. right so we want to take these things and just push them into other media and, and other channels right and take people on a bit of a journey whether or not that's a physical experience at a, at a festival or something cool that you might see on the London Underground or, or whatever it might be, you know, and it, it's that sort of storytelling that I think makes the brand sticky. I think the other thing is, in really simple terms, I really don't want to use this language, but like, it's just quite cool, right? Like we have a huge thing about stealing uh, people stealing our pint glasses from pubs, right? Yeah. And actually today, this morning, Will and my team sent around a TikTok that a pub literally filmed of someone stealing stuff from the pub, right? And from my perspective, more power to you, because if you steal our pint glasses and stick them in your cupboard and you come down in the morning and have a glass of water, you're reminded by the brand. That's right? an ad campaign. Yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. get in your you cupboards, yeah. right? And yeah. shouldn't. That would be yeah. weird, right? But I can, you know, I can get on your TV, but it costs yeah. money, right? Yeah. But more power to people that, so that you, want to do that. So are you that. designing glassware to be stolen then? Or you design it to be desirable enough that someone might want to? It, it, it's almost more simple than that. You know, Nick designed a glass that he just thought looked cool. And so do lots of other people, which is why they want to steal it. But having that brand affinity, having that brand approach is great. Now, what's really important for us is as you grow and scale, as all brands do, right? You've got to keep that, right? You've yeah. got to keep doing those interesting things. Um, and that's what's really important. So it's a bit like your gift gaff experience, actually, this, because beer, a bit like telecoms, is incredibly dominated by a few players, right? Both in distribution and in brand. So the amount of tied estates you got, you've got listing agreements in the big supermarkets, you've got huge, huge budgets to build brand, right? And then you look at craft beer, where there's over 2,000 craft beer businesses in the UK. What made Beavertown stand out? What made Beavertown cut through in yeah. all that? I think part of it is time and place. You know, Beavertown came up with with a couple of other, you know, big craft breweries. I think they were very famous. You know, I knew them from a consumer perspective before I, you know, went to work for them. I think they were famous for their, you know, tap room and, you know, in Tottenham, which is still open. You still go there. I think, you know, there were some really savvy decisions around things like the microbrewery and, and bar that we've got in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. But I think... It's a combination of those things, but equally it's being accessible. I think sometimes historically craft beer could be seen as something that happens over here by people who are slightly cooler than you, right? And I don't think, and I haven't felt either from a consumer perspective or, you know, looking after the brand that that we do that. We actively don't. And to the conversation we had earlier about culture, it's because the culture isn't that, 
right? The culture is one around, you know, Logan's one of the most down-to-earth people I've ever met. You know, it's, oh, you want to bring a mate? Yeah, yeah, well, all right, cool, you know. And it's, it's, it's very much that approach. And I think that's infectious. And I think that comes across in, in what we do. I think the other aspect is because, you know, I mean, there's loads of wild and wonderful cans out there that look beautiful, but there wasn't at the time, you know. I think that, you know, Beaver Town was the first craft beer brand to go into free 30 mil cans and cans, you know, cans were traditionally seen as that's the sort of beer that, you know, we yeah. don't yeah. want people to drink. You know, this one in the glass is a fancy one, you know. And that, that totally bucked that, that trend. That totally flips you know? my head. I know because that's about the time I was at Brewdog, actually, is, is there was that flip from, as you say, the bottle to the can mm. happened really a year or two that that whole thing changed. You know, you had a four-pack can. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, when we were kids, it would be like Strongbow Down the Park kind of association, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. not, not, not craft beer. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. You go into Tesco now or wherever and you look at, you know, the range of cans... And I think the other thing is, I think the market is developed as well. You know, if you think about 440 mil specials, you know, there's loads of different options for consumers. And surely that's a good thing. And they can come in and come out and run for, you know, short runs and all the rest of it. And I just think that it adds vibrancy to the market, which I think helps consumers feel like they're, you know, feel passionate about it, right? Because you've got lots of different options. And, and you know, we are, as people super savvy consumers more so than ever right so you can tell things that are real you can tell things that are interesting you can tell things that are just marketing hype and i think those combination of things has kind of helped us you know speed to market product i mean ultimately the product's got to be you know stonking right and neck oil is a is a cracking beer so that helps right and then you've got all these beautiful brand storytelling wrapped around it that's you know kind of like sci-fi and movies and all that kind of thing and and you know part of that zeitgeist and we are where we are you mentioned logan of course you know quite a famous founder what was what was it like working for the founder and what difference does having a founder in a business make to it i think it's it, it's it, you know it's amazing right because ultimately you can talk to the person that started it and go particularly from a brand point of view right and you go so why did you do this or why do you want to do that so just tell me about it and almost it's just some of the words that people will use when it's their own business just gives you a greater insight into why things have happened, need to happen, should happen, right? And that, and, and that is unique. Logan's whole approach, he was, you know, the first person I met when I was, you know, talking about doing the role and all the rest of it, just incredibly down to earth and an in, in, in incredibly likeable, smart, passionate person. And again, that kind of is infectious and helpful. And that, you know, ultimately it was the person that I went, yeah, actually, I'd, you know, I'd like to work for this guy. It was a bit like we were saying before, actually, is that people leave businesses because of the boss, but you also join a business because of the boss, right? The yeah. person you work for is a huge part of your yeah. love for the company. A- a- yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, to steer the business through what is done and make Nickel what it is and, you know, grow it in the way that yeah. we have, I think is, is incredible. So, yeah, it was, a, you know, pleasure to, you know, to work with Logan. Now, know. I must ask about ownership as well, because uh, obviously James Watt got himself into uh, a bit of controversy when he bought some Heineken shares. Now, of course, Heineken originally bought a share in Beavertown, didn't it? And then has bought Beavertown out. What's been the difference in experience in, you know, going from a founder-led company to, a, I guess, a huge multinational business? I, my, my genuine answer, in all total honesty, so I look you in the eye, is it's exactly the same. Right. In a totally good way, it's exactly the same. If not, it's actually just maybe a little bit better. Right. Because ultimately the business was at a point where it needed just an element of it was like a, you know, it's like a young teenager going into a later teenager. And it just needed that sort of, I don't know, support to get to that next step, you know, to get into college or, you know, university or whatever. It's a silly analogy. And I and I think that's happened, you know. And I think, you know, what, what I don't want to put words in the mouth, but I think what Heineken can see is this thing works, right? Like this thing really works. So let's just let it work, it, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think often, you know, and again, GifGaf was the same, you know, Telefonica and OT saw that it worked. So it's like, just let it work, you know, like support it in the right way and just let the thing, you know, do what it needs to do. I think that, you know, traditionally it was kind of like, don't do that, like just pull it across and you know we now own it and it's all a bit you know sort of masculine and da, 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 da. and and i just haven't i haven't seen that 
You know? I think that's such a good insight here. I mean, if you look at um, when Coke bought Innocent as well, that they, they, you know, Innocent Towers remained. And if you talk to anyone from Innocent, they said they had full control over all brands and packaging and products and everything else. And that Coke were, you know, one arm, you know, arm's length removed, really. And I don't know if you've read the book um, Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, yeah. but that really points out, I, I can't remember how many he looked at, but he looked at every big company innovating and anywhere where they tried to innovate within the business, it always failed because the innovation would never be big enough for them to care enough, you know. So I don't know if, if your hurdle rate right was, well, you know, it needs to be 100,000 sales a week and the innovation was 10,000 sales, it'd basically get, get neglected. And the conclusion of that book, if I remember it rightly, is the only way for innovation in big companies to succeed is to give it the freedom and almost manage it as a completely separate management team, separate incentives, you know, complete freedom from the mothership. So it's good to see uh, Heineken living that out. Yeah, I think I think there's a, there's a couple of things in that. I think we are in a world where test and learn, minimal viable products has become normal, predominantly, if not entirely, born out of tech. And I think that's helpful because I think that gives a basis and a parameter to be able to innovate and try things that otherwise would be squashed because they didn't, you know, they're not big enough and resource and cost and all of those things. So I think that's I think that's helpful. But also I think there's a maturity in understanding big doesn't always mean best and that actually the culture and the people that are involved in that business may be different than the norm for the bigger business and maybe that's a good thing right so to the conversation we were having around harnessing creativity if an environment is working and it has an element of that creativity why would you go in and start to you know pull it apart or whatever else it just doesn't it doesn't make sense so i think those things are helping businesses make better decisions to help brands grow and build which ultimately means that consumers have more choice well it's a maturity of understanding that what makes you successful when you're a multi multi billion dollar global you know beer brand that's the same everywhere isn't the same as a very rapidly expanding multi million pound craft brewery in london right they are different they are different you know brands different stage in their life cycle and needs to be treated differently absolutely and i think the element that i think is important to that is being able to keep whatever it that thing is that works as you scale and grow right we've all seen brands and businesses amazing at one time and then they, and everyone goes oh well they used to be good and all the rest of it right that's the trick Right. And if you can do that, then then you're winning. Yeah. That's completely. Now, we must talk about Madfest because last year uh, you got everyone to get their mobile phones out and hand them to someone they didn't know. Right. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. for the listeners who, uh, who, who weren't there, tell us what you tell us what your talk was about last year and how you did that. So I was on the big stage, which is nice. Gives you lots of room, gives you lots of audience. So I wanted to see something around trust, right? And the talk I was giving was about, you know, starting a cultural revolution. And the positioning was, to do that, we have to trust each other. So I asked people to get their mobile phone out, open it, and hand it to someone that they, they didn't know, which is a demonstration, ultimately, of, of, of trust. Our phones are very personal to us. They're full of personal things. Therefore, to do that is, 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 a, is a leap of faith. So that's where I... That's where I started and then I began ranting and then 20 minutes later I finished. It reminds me of that Michael McIntyre thing where he gets gets the phone out of the, oh, of the yeah. celebrity. Have you seen that? He gets, I have, if he, yeah. If he interviews a celebrity, he, he, he borrows their phone and then uh, I, I can't remember how many, the last 10 people they message and there'll be it's other celebrities. Staged, though, isn't it? Uh, of course it is, yeah. <laughs> you know, but the idea of it, I just think it's hilarious. Yeah, you know, yeah. What the last 10 messages you sent and what was the context behind yeah. it could be Cause incredibly it's, revealing. Because they text, they text like a, 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 a group of people don't know whatever, like, and, and, and ultimately the only person that would actually probably probably respond is my mum yeah you know I, mean? I think everyone else would just ignore me yeah well hopefully not okay okay we'll bring us to this year of Madfest. what's what's going to be the equivalent of the uh phone honesty pitch yeah okay so yeah so um i mean it's amazing to be asked to do Madfest again it's my third year of doing it so super exciting i think i'm thursday midday if anyone's there what's thursday come midday. down i don't know what i'm going to do at the start we will see what I'm going to talk about is a lot of things that we talked about today, really, which is around 
businesses that have a cultural approach have an advantage. That cultural approach will help you deliver creativity and it will help you deliver ultimately brand growth. And that's pretty much what I'm going to be talking about. It's a workshop. Quite what bit of it is the workshop bit I'm still figuring out. But there'd be some kind of involvement somewhere. I did think I was like between um, when I was talking to, you know, the great guys at Madfest, I was like, could I learn to do what Darren Brown does in like two months? Right. I decided no is the answer. But I would like to do something. The 10,000 hours he put in to get no, to that level. Yeah, do you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm not going to be able to pull You're that Darren Brown live. Like, like, could you get Darren Brown to coach you? Like, you got two weeks, get coached by the I master. Mean, I mean, I would. Phenomenal. I mean, I would love to. But, but yeah, so, so the workshop bit I'm figuring out. But yeah, culture, people, building brands, creativity, and maybe, maybe some bad jokes or two. <laughs> I love the theme this year as well, Riding the Storm, because like the last, well, the last three years you've been doing it, right? We, we've lived through like an age, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to use unprecedented, I should not do that. Um, we've lived through quite a period of change, haven't we, as marketers? And it has feel, it's like you've gone from flipping COVID to cost of living to like demands being up and down. You must find it in the pub sector as well. Like they're open, they're shut, they're open again. You know, it's been incredible as marketers. Like we've had a lot to kind of, you know, change and respond to. So I, I love the theme. So I can see that working well. I spoke at something quite recently and it was mainly just marketers. And, um, and, and normally the stuff I speak at is, you know, a broad, a broad church. And this, this pretty much this is this kind of CMOs. And it made me think to myself, being a CMO is actually quite lonely <laughs> because it's a very senior position, which are always quite lonely. And every conversation you have is always, you know, in some way, something is trying to get worked out somewhere. And it just made me think that actually, you know, the giving an ability for CMOs to be able to talk to each other, I think is an interesting concept because you're right. There has been a huge storm that's weathered and whether or not that's, you know, we, we from a marketing perspective, we pushed really hard through COVID because the whole strategy and there's lots of papers to support it, which is like in bad times, that's you almost make more noise yeah, yeah, than less yeah. noise, you know, so we, so. You know, in the first week, we were just running around trying to organise, you know, Zoom pubs, which now seem, you know, ridiculous, but at the time, you know, seemed like a good idea to make those happen. And it just meant that you, you drove really hard through that. It finishes and then you have to go back to exactly what you were doing before, even though loads of weird stuff happens, yeah. you know. And a friend of mine said to me, um, you won't be and don't expect the people that work for you to be the same during this period of time yeah. than before, right? Because things have changed and whether or not we recognise that, want to recognise it, but it will. I think the loneliness of CMO is so true. I, I, I get the advantage of meeting a lot of CMOs. And I see that everywhere. I think part of the reason is that, and I, I experienced this in my own career as well, as you're going up the ladder, you're always in a team. Right. You're always with people doing the same thing as you. You can have the joke about it. You can share it. You can, you know, you, you're living it together. Right. Once you become the most senior marketer in your organization, your colleagues are no longer marketers. They're like the supply chain guy. They're the HR guy. They're the finance you know, girl or whatever. You know, so suddenly you're talking a different language. They, they don't under they're, they're not going, oh, geez, great tweet last night, Tom, <laughs> like yeah. celebrating your, you know, the magnificence and cleverness of your tweet. Yeah. You know, that's that, that. They don't even understand it. They're like, in fact, most of, most of them have got a strong opinion about it. It's usually not a marketer's opinion. It's usually completely different. And, and, and yet you've got the pressure of the business results. Often it's, the, I think, the most pressured role because whereas other roles, you know, you've got your KPIs and it, it, it's, it's black and white. The CMO role is so, you know, grey in a way, isn't it? Is it short term? Is it long term? Is it, you know, is it art? Is it science? Is it fixed KPIs or what is it sort of thing? So it can be a very stressful place to be. And, the, and there aren't really, I mean, I, you know, I, I think people sometimes think, oh, yeah, CMOs must meet and go around the golf course on a Friday or whatever. You know, that does not happen, right? Yeah. There is no... There is no kind of CMO club, you know. I mean, I think in America they might have one. But over here anyway, there isn't the equivalent of that mutual society yeah. that kind of supports one another. I mean, there's, I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do agree. I mean, it's it's interesting because sort of thinking about what you were saying and some of the, you know, conversations that I've had recently, which is around, you know, 
because we bolt on an in-house model to that, you're basically doing what a creative agency would do and a marketing agency, right? With arguably less people. And that creates a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety for, for everyone because you're asking people to do the full range of things and then you're going in, going to people, did you hear that tiny thing there that was panned left in the sound that we were really proud, you know, and yeah. people are like, what? Yeah, okay, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's great. You know, so, so the, the, the reason that understanding or recognition, but I think that's the same for all roles in a way, you know, I don't, I don't you know, I've got loads of time for operations and logistics people. I'm awful at logistics, right? And I imagine there's loads of stuff that, that, that we as marketeers don't see that happens under the hood that means, you know, in our case, our beer goes from A to B and, and that's fine and, you know, great. It's interesting to consider at the point where, what's the destination, right? What is it that everyone, like, you know, it's like, okay, well, I've managed this brand or then I'm going to do that brand. Like, what, what, where's the bit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And I know people always go, oh, well, you know, always take time to, to, you know, get recognition and say thanks and stuff. But you don't, you know, I remember when I was coming to the end of my tenure at GIFGAV, um, someone that worked for us in one of our tech teams um, called Ruth came up to me and she went, she, she was new or just joined the business stuff. And she was like, oh, you must be really proud of what you've achieved. And I literally just thought, what? <laughs> yeah. I was like walking down the corridors, go to a meeting about something which is, you know, seemed super important, but probably wasn't, right? And I remember just being like, fucking hell, I've never even thought about it. But you never look back, though. It's like climbing a mountain, isn't it? Where you, you do the first bit, you get out of breath or whatever. You never look around to go, when you look around, you go, well, we've come such a long way. But it doesn't feel like that because you're knackered and you're looking at what's ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, th I think the other thing there is around, do you make good decisions and do good things happen for businesses when people are knackered? I'm not sure. Well, we did some research, actually, we shared recently about the percentage of marketers that are either having counselling, suffering under stress and anxiety. It's something like 30%. And so the question, this was, I think the ad association I was sharing this, I basically posed the question, is that the right environment for creativity to flourish? Yeah. I mean, we all know the answer to it, right? If, if one in three of the people in our industry are at a point of mental exhaustion, anxiety, stress, to the point at which they can't function and do their jobs, that's a lot of yeah. talent that's not operating at its full capacity. Absolutely. And I, and, I, and I think it comes back to, is that the right environment for creativity to flourish? Absolutely not. Do people want creativity to flourish or do they just think that they might? And do people actually put the value and approaches on it where it can? And I think that the, 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 there's almost a break in marketing, right? There's like marketing scientists and marketing artists, right? And it's kind of like artists and soldiers, you know? And I think for lots of different reasons, tech being one, measurement being another, there is a leaning towards science and therefore that may achieve whatever it is you want to achieve, right? And that's great. But are you compromising long-term impact, you know, long-term growth equity of that, of impact of that brand? And are you compromising creativity? I always think the answer to that, art versus science, is uh, science for the planning, art for the solution. Because actually it's the art that gives you the idea to do something that's going to be more effective than, than, than the average. Because at the end of the day, everyone's got access to the same tools. We might have different budgets, right? But you can follow the science in terms of what split of spend should I spend across these different types of media? You know, um, should I prioritize mental availability, physical availability? That's all well and good. And that will tell you how to create the plan and set your course. But how you execute that, that's where the art comes in. Completely agree. I think what's what's key to achieve that is that the science understands there's a bit of art and art yeah. needs to come into this <laughs> well, at some point. That, that's, that's, you know? the, that's what doesn't happen, I suspect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been experimenting with the last question as well, which, which just, just to keep you on your toes right till the end. If you were to identify the biggest failure in your career, what would it be and what did you learn? The biggest failure... 
I think there's two answers. I think there's loads of stuff like, you know, stupid things you've done, like, or decisions you've made or campaigns that, you know, happened for whatever reason that didn't, didn't achieve it. I think my biggest failure would probably be, I think no one's going to come and help you, right? So you have to kind of look after yourself, right? Like physically, mentally, because at those points where you're in good health, good mental state, all the rest of it, you'll make great decisions, you'll make great campaigns, and you'll be completely additive to that business, right? If you're not doing those things, then you won't be, right? And I think from my perspective, there's been times where I've been too stressed out or, uh, or you know, the distraction happens or you get fixated with a problem that's not even a problem. And therefore, your ability to deliver at the level that you want to has been compromised. So therefore, I think I could list loads of stuff that, you know, ran a campaign once that was meant to do X and it did Y. Yeah, of course, all that stuff, whatever, right? That's what everyone CMO could say. But ultimately, I think the failure is you have to look after yourself. You do. I mean, uh, uh, one of the best bosses I've ever worked for always had, had this phrase that success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. And, and, it, and that's, that's the tough thing with failure is that very quickly, everyone will look at you and blame, you know, point the blame. Well, a bad team will, bad culture, I have to say. Of course, when things go well, everyone's part of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we all had a hand in that. It's team effort, you know. Yeah. In a way, it'd be lovely, wouldn't it, if it was a team effort for failure. Actually, if something goes wrong, this is on all of us because we all played a part in it. But, but, but I very rarely see that. Usually it's like, no, that was who's to blame when something goes wrong. I'm a big subscriber in that every problem comes with a gift in its hand. Even if it is class as a failure to someone, to something, to that moment in time that could seem catastrophic, right? And in that moment, it may, or moments, but actually it may provide an opportunity, a situation, a learning, which is all, you know, yeah. you sit on a high seat and say these things, right? But actually, I think if you, if you can really start to analyse and understand rationally and not just emotively, right, those problems to see what the gift in the hand is, I think it really helps you. My, my theory based on experience, but I, I, I see it play out so many times, is my greatest successes have happened after my greatest failures. Because it's actually what you learn and your self-understanding and your insight in those moments of failures equips you to achieve the success. But what I love about what you were saying there is you have to have you have to be able to protect yourself because I, I've seen people broken through failure that have you know been unemployed for two years or something. You know, um, if you let failure break you, you'll never reap the rewards of learning from that. Yeah, I I I think so. I think it's very difficult because I think it's about where you associate the value, right? So if you go through life believing you'll never fail and you're one of those people, you know, I never fail, I always win, da 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 you know, you're as stereotypical as that may be, then you're going to take the natural occurrence of failure, right? It's, it's going to do, it's going to hit really, really hard. I think linked to that is the, the more, the more I think about this kind of stuff, I don't think anyone really has it down 100% right regardless of what what role you've got and people talk about imposter syndrome and i kind of buy into that you know i kind of understand it obviously but i think it's more around people's perception particularly when you get into more senior roles is well they must you know they must know everything they totally have it down and i remember meeting an ad agency once that said um we have the answers to all of your problems i was like no you don't i was like no one does i don't expect you to you know, I don't expect you to, right? So I think if you can understand those ups and downs and, and, and take the higher seat or, or, or take the step back and view them, then I think it's going to help you. But I think there is a perception that everyone in senior roles or whatever, you know, it's like completely... We're, we're buttoned right, down rightly or wrongly it. like the more senior i've got the less i realize i know because suddenly you have to be across a much broader set of disciplines 
you understand there's a load more connectivity and nuance than a lot more gray than black and white. You're no longer the subject matter experts. You haven't got that satisfaction that comes from, I did something and there's the pack or I developed this flavor and now everyone loves it. You know, you don't have that feedback of, oh yeah, that's mine. I worked on that. You're just accountable for everyone else's. You know, it's, it's very, you realize there's so much more nuance and gray area than maybe there is when you're in a discipline of a functional role. Yeah, I think a a good friend of mine called Alistair said to me, um, don't have a to-do list, have a to-think-about list, right? I was like, yeah, it's quite a good point, actually, isn't it? You know, because if you're not foreseeing, you know, the senior roles should be, yes, day-to-day. It's probably a broader question, yes, day-to-day, but it is about seeing what's coming, right, and planning for what is coming and making sure teams prepared, business prepared, brand prepared and taking opportunities and, and spotting them. But if you don't ever think about it in a list way, you know, or, or dedicate time to it, then you're not going to see those things, right? You're going to be having a stupid conversation about, you know, tax or something, yeah. you know, like POs, yeah. you know, like it's just, it's, um, it's I, I, I've, I've got a theory which I haven't really thought out but I'll try it on you, right? Which is, I think the next big business question needs to be waste, right? Like businesses waste time, they waste people, they waste resources. They were, like How much percentage of a business is being wasted? And actually, even if you take those down by a percentage or two, how more successful is that business going to be as a result of that? I think if you can start to think about some of those questions and maybe, you know, in those spare five minutes that you don't have, sort of think about, well, actually, what what elements could I do that could reduce the waste of this business? You know, time being one, right? And don't go to that meeting, right? Don't respond to that email that doesn't need to be responded to, right? And I think, you know, they are the marginal gains that actually could be really different and beneficial for a business. Well, that's a wonderful way, a wonderful place to end. A big question, how do you turn waste into a marginal gain? I think that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> Tom, thank you so much. And thoroughly looking forward, to, by the way, to your session at Madfest next week, which is 12 p.m.? 12 p.m. Thursday. On the Thursday. Yeah. So uh, grab a ticket, get yourself along there and uh, hear Tom in person. Perfect. Thanks so much. Nice one. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Uncensored CMO. It's great to have you with me. If you'd like to never miss an episode again, then please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to watch Uncensored CMO, please go over to YouTube and hit the subscribe button. If you want to follow me, you can do. I'm over at Twitter at Uncensored CMO and on LinkedIn, John Evans. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.